Today, water levels in the Great Lakes are at near record highs following a period of record lows. Understanding and communicating the drivers behind water level variability, particularly in light of recent extremes, is a fundamental step towards improving regional water resources management and policy. Are the ways in which water levels go up, go down, maybe stay low for longer periods or stay high for longer periods, how is that going to impact the growth of cities, the migration of people to the Great Lakes, changes in water supply, and changes in the economy? That's a big picture research question that needs to be answered, and we're really well poised to answer it. Water levels are the best indication that we have of long-term storage. But beyond that, most people interact with the Great Lakes through the coastlines. And the water level fluctuations along the coastline have a huge impact on where you can put a home, where you can put a commercial establishment, where your beach is, and even where you can put a drinking water intake pipe. We should be planning for dynamic water levels and the fact that they're going to be really low for periods of time, and they're going to be really high for periods of time. And, and we ought to kind of recognize there's a band of dynamic movement between water and land that we need to account for. That's the place where we maybe really need to learn to live with nature instead of thinking that we can engineer our way out of what nature does. There's really not a strong indication that water levels are likely, on average, to be much, much higher or much, much lower than they were over the past 50 or 100 years. What's important is the rate at which they might change. Uh, the rate at which water is coming into the Great Lakes Basin is changing, and the rate at which it's evaporating is changing as well. And those two forces guide the variability in water levels over time. One of the great things about being at the University of Michigan is the range of colleagues we have in fields like policy, economics, and business. And their perspective is not exclusively, in fact, sometimes it's not even on the Great Lakes, but it's a national or global perspective. Multidisciplinary research collaborations at Michigan also seek answers to problems surrounding water abundance and water scarcity. With the discrepancy between water abundance in Central North America and water scarcity, in the arid southwest and parts of California and other areas in the western United States. There is a huge gradient in the amount of water. And people living in the Great Lakes need to be aware of that gradient and the possible increasing demand on water from other parts of the country for, from places where it's abundant. Currently, the Great Lakes Compact, a 2008 federal agreement between the eight Great Lakes states and two Canadian provinces, prohibits new or increased diversions of water from the Great Lakes to areas outside the Great Lakes St. Lawrence River Basin with provisions for a small number of exceptions. The research question we're asking is, is that what the compact was intended to do? To what extent do we need water for the ecosystem as well as for human use? And are there ways that we can modify our use of water both within and outside of the basin and still maintain the spirit of the compact? A second lens is looking at groundwater. There are large pockets of groundwater beneath the Great Lakes that are not connected directly to the Great Lakes, but they can be depleted long before the surface water supplies are de depleted. So I think it's important that people in the region get a strong understanding of what aquifers are and what it means to deplete the water in a subsurface aquifer. And then the third and final point has to do with water quality. We can have all the water in the world here in the Great Lakes, but if we aren't careful about maintaining its quality, then it's going to have limited long-term use to us as a drinking water supply and as a use for a lot of other resources.